I'm Tony Esselin. And I'm Amy Bernard. And we are here to help make it make sense. This is the podcast that takes complicated science and breaks it down into easy to understand language. So buckle up, buttercups. You are in for a bumpy ride. All right. Welcome. Um, Today, we have a very special guest, yet another University of Rochester alum, which (laughs) seems to be a lot of our our guests these days. Um, We have Dr. Ingrid Walker-Descartes. Like I said, she attended the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry and got her MD, so doctorate in medicine. Um, since graduating from University of Rochester, she had a residency in pediatrics at New York Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. She did further training in general academic pediatrics and a child abuse fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital. She's also been on faculty or is on faculty at Maimonides. 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 Okay. Maimonides Children's Hospital of Brooklyn um, in the Department of Pediatrics. And she has two roles there, one as a clinician, as the other um, as an administrator. So in her clinical roles, she practices general pediatrics and a child abuse pediatrics. Um, She also is program director of the pediatrics residency training program fellowship director for the Child Abuse Fellowship Program and vice chair of education for the Department of Pediatrics and the director of child maltreatment services for Children's Hospital. That is a lot of hats. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much she runs the hospital. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed she does. Folks who run the hospital are very supportive. So I'm (laughs) <laughs> well, they trust you with a lot of roles, obviously. So um, in addition, um, she her, her job is to ensure that many children who enter the child welfare system receive trauma-informed care that will optimize their outcomes. Um, and she serves in the role of chief medical officer for one of New York City's most formidable foster care organizations. So she has a role as clinician, healthcare administrator, and educator that has led her to this, um, all of these different hats and responsibilities um, about pediatric medical education. And then we're gonna talk today about workforce challenges. Well, thank you so much, welcome. You're obviously just a a wealth of information that's gonna help a lot of our listeners learn more about what you do, but also the peds med education and workforce challenges. So uh, we'll take it from there. Well, yes. thank you, Amy and Tony, for inviting me. I'm really excited about this and very happy to share what I know Amazing. and learn what I don't. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Amazing. We're so happy to have you. We only have high quality guests here at Help Make It Make Sense. So uh, your pedigree has just, again, blessed us. Um, and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so we wanted to, we could start the conversation off with like one of the words that's completely in the news, in the media, everywhere you turn, people are talking about it um, and it's burnout. And one of the things that, you know, I've given a couple of talks on burnout um, that I like to, uh, I like to distinguish is that burnout is not a mental health disorder. (laughs) Burnout is actually, is, is um, a feeling of apathy that you have from the, from the toxicity of your job or from the fact that your job is just not giving you that giving you that um, that passion, um, that interest that you may have had a, had before. And it just makes you, it just, it causes apathy and indifference. Um, as opposed to depression, which is a completely different story and burnout can lead to depression, but they're two separate entities. And one of the things that we've talked about on the podcast is that, you know, burnout Burnout was a problem before the pandemic. That was already an issue because of the way that our structures and our systems are set up. That was already a problem. And then came COVID and it just blew the whole thing right open. Um, And one of the places where we have felt a lot of the pressure has been in pediatrics, right? Um, And so we wanted to talk a little bit today about what has been your experience before the pandemic, during the pandemic, 
Now, I will not say we are post-pandemic, uh, contrary to what our government entities are saying. <laughs> I think we are still in the pandemic. We are still dealing with this crisis. Um, but you know, now that we're in a place where we have tools to combat uh, the infection um, and some of the um, the uh, problems that have come with the pandemic, you know, what what is what has been your experience through this spectrum of time that we've experienced together? Mm -hmm. So in terms of just, it's funny that, you know, when I think about um, burnout and you talk about passion, that is definitely one of the reasons I entered into the medical education space. Because one of those things as you're kind of going through medicine and you're learning all of this stuff and you're applying it to patients, the question is, where else can it be applicable? And so when I thought about kind of where else can this be applicable, in those times that I felt apathy and in those times that I felt like, what is this for? I look at my learners and their expectations and that's what kind of pulls me back in to say, okay, get your craft together. Um, this is not about you. And it's funny that you should say, you know, in terms of burnout and mental health, different entities, but I think the same resources address them and that mental health resources are needed because you talked about also that kind of continuum from burnout to depression. And so it's kind of what is that place of intervention? And one of the things that in this space and kind of, you know, you, as you teach learners and generations come, you really try to stop yourself from saying back in my day, right? But Back in my day, what was burnout, right? You kind of felt like, I'm just getting lazy. What the hell is this? Snap out of it. And there wasn't that kind of reiteration of, you need to take care of yourself before you take care of anyone else. And similar to the analogy, like on the airplane, you know, you have to put on your mask before you help others. We really weren't taught that. So in this space of medical education and burnout and so on, I've definitely found a way for me personally, and that's functioning and trying to be highly functional in a med ed space and keep that passion that made me want to do this. And I think it's that reevaluation of that passion and taking the time to stop to do that, that COVID really didn't allow. And so that's why, as you said, it burst wide open that's and right. a lot of people realized I'm not well here. I am not passionate about this. I don't want to do that. And so that has impacted, yes, a lot of kind of how a lot of us have coped with and managed burnout, but there's still that, as I said, that gap with teaching who we're teaching and supporting them in a concept that we didn't learn as a part of our foundation, which is take care of ourselves to take care of patients. That's right. Do you think, um, and I'm going to ask, uh, with your, with where you work and the people that you, um, you know, that you surround yourself with and all the different roles that you have, are there resiliency or burnout kind of programs that are starting where you are? Um, and I'm just going to say at the um, University of Colorado, where I am, I'm at the Anschutz Medi Medical Campus. Children's Hospital here, as well as University Hospital, is starting to have like resiliency, like workshops and programs. And I'm just, which, you know, is new. It should be, should have been there forever. Like you said, we just thought we were getting tired and lazy. So we just reboot ourselves. Right? Um, but do you see that where you work? Is there, are there things like yeah. that coming up? Yeah, and it's not new. At Maimonides, we do treat a huge underserved population. And a lot of our families come with, again, what we're now calling social determinants of health, which we were calling just kind of regular everyday needs. And so we were dealing with a lot of patients that were under-resourced, um, had difficult access to care, and there was secondary trauma from that. Because in a lot of those cases, there was that feeling of helplessness, and we identified that our trainees needed more. That being said, we started having kind of resilience workshops, identifying stress, and so on and so forth. And these kind of programs, I've been a residency program director for about 15 years, and those programs started um, years before me. So at Maimonides, I have to say that we are 
appropriately tapped in. The challenge we had recently was how do you get people in medicine to appropriately access those resources, right? Because we are taught that we are superhumans. Nothing's well until COVID. Nothing stops us. Nothing when you're, you know, we don't get tired. We don't need sleep. We just go, go, go. And what happened with that is that we had to kind of say the resources are here. How do we make it such that it's not, how would I say, it's not taboo to access them. So at our program, we have something called um, the vitals program where every single trainee that's recruited has to see our psychologist. Has to. So everybody has seen a psychologist. So it's normalizing that contact. And then from there, they can choose to continue or not. So we've identified a lot of that, not from COVID, but from the fact that our populations that we serve come with so much stuff that can be so emotionally taxing that that space was created. And I have to say what COVID did to that was make it so that there's an increased referral. And I'm saying increased referral because as much as many trainees still have their one interaction, to them, it's just something on the checklist. And as program leadership, when you kind of talk to them and see areas where they're slipping, you have to say, now it's time for you to go back. So I'm very proud to say we're not at a place where mental health is an afterthought and that connection between depression and um, burnout has not been connected. We also, we're in New York City where physician suicide is also a reality. So whenever it happens, that causes ripples in all the programs. So we have been very much on top of those resources and I'm very happy to say I'm at a place where I can refer my residents um, and they're not kind of shocked about what that is because they've already had their vitals consultation with a mental health provider. That's amazing. I wonder if, you know, for both um, you and as also Amy, since you talked about them starting it, I think one of the things that I um, notice and, and kind of, you know, have mixed feelings about are these resilience trainings, because that takes the onus off the system to change. And it puts putting it on the the workers to to build resiliency and courage and seek out services and all of that stuff. So how how are these trainings or how are these opportunities for um, tapping into resources making an impact on making the system move and mm -hmm. and and function differently? Or or is that possible? Is that happening? Or um, what's the accountability mechanism there? Mm -hmm. So. With resilience, the question is, what does that look like? And when I hear resiliency training, it's very difficult for me to, how would I say? I don't think you can teach someone resilience. I think they have to go through something and it's almost like a reactionary realization. Like, wow, I've been through some stuff and I survived it. Now you can then take how you survived and how you cope and say, here are the things I want to change. Here are some of the things that I don't want to change. This actually showed strength in me. Prior to COVID, I think resiliency training was just a checkbox. And one of the things I always do as a program director and as a person recruiting, when I look at my applicants and my candidates, and I'm very happy to say, I have a very diverse residency training program. And my thing is that every single child that comes in our hospital should see at least one healthcare provider that looks like them. I think that is incredibly important. And I think it's important for what I call aspirational disparities because until they see somebody like them do it, they don't think they can. Put that aside, how do I recruit that diverse group? What does resilience look like in medical education? I think for a very long time, for a lot of program leadership, it looked like the person who always scored high, the person who had perfect grades, the person who was able to kind of train all the way through with no interruptions. And I often say, to me, that sounds boring. Patients are coming to you when they're at their lowest point. They, would, they don't want to hear about your perfect damn life. They want to hear about 
pardon me, when you've dealt with some shit. And you need to tap into that time to connect to them because that's what they're dealing with now. So resilience to me looks like someone that has fallen down, but it's how they get up. They're not perfect people. And so for those individuals that have had perfect lives, I guess they need resiliency training. But for a lot of my candidates from a lot of diverse backgrounds, they come with that. It's now giving them the tools so that as they go through it, which they will again and again, they can cope in better ways and they have more in their toolbox. Because resiliency training tells you about ways to cope with things, right? But if you haven't dealt with the things, how do you know what tools you need? So it's almost an abstract concept. So resiliency training is wonderful, but I feel like medical education, we have to look at what that looks like. Because when you have people at the table that have had to kind of deal with it, their input is what's going to build a more informed system to continue to nurture it. So it sounds like for for where you are, you're using um, improvement in the workforce in terms of what, how it reflects the community that you're serving in order to um, have the system be accountable to more um, like resilient structures. Is that, is, did I hear that correct? Correct. And you can build kind of resilient structures if those at the table are informed. And if those at the table are informed, then it's easy for them to tap into their humanism at the bedside and that to continue to be standard of practice. That's really impressive. Um, that sounds like an incredibly comprehensive, well thought out, thoroughly designed <laughs> program. I, I try. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, very impressive. I'll have to um tell the people I know here <laughs> to look look to your program. Um, well, well, folks are calling it holistic interviewing, yeah. right? Which is taking all these things into consideration. And I think when you do that, you realize that what a doctor comes with and what a doctor should come with is not about just pass rates for, um, you know, step one, step two, step three. Yep. It's all these other tools mm -hmm. that um, probably has never been looked at as strengths mm -hmm. that once COVID hit, we were like, okay, we have to remember we're humans. Mm -hmm. We have to remember we're treating humans. Mm -hmm. We have to remain humane. We have to, you know, and it's all that stuff where you didn't think you'd have to be reiterating those points. But when you are having something hit you like COVID did mm -hmm. and everything seems like it's falling apart around you, the only thing that connects us to our patients is that we're all human. Yeah, right. that That's makes right. sense. And I think sometimes when people are like in an emergent crisis like that, it's it's kind of easy to, it seems silly, but kind of easy to forget that, which you know, it seems foundational, but sometimes we have to be reminded of things that should just kind of come naturally to us, right? They probably go back to their like step one, step two, what's the right thing to do and forgetting to breathe, correct? Correct, correct. <laughs> so I know you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to ask the question more directly, but what does burnout look like in the pediatric population in particular? Mm -hmm. I think it looks like it looks in other people. And the reason I say that is because people come to pediatrics thinking that they're going to be dealing with just kids. But remember, before you get to the kids, you have a wall of crazy parents and they're crazy because their most prized possession is not well. So if you're having, you know, issues around communication with adults, those are gonna continue because you're gonna interact with adults before you interact with that child. I have to say for pediatricians, the ones I've worked with, a kid comes in the room, we all melt. Like kids don't feel what we're feeling, I'm gonna say directly, right? But the indirect cost of that is maybe the oversights when we're doing some of the technical work, the inputting of orders, so on and so forth, because that child is just another, another to do, another, another, another. 
But at the bedside, I'm going to say once we're in front of our pediatric patients, that reminds us why we did this. However, what it looks like, as I said, is just like when adults work with other adults, miscommunication, short temper, lack of patience, kind of just check, check box, check box, check box. And so it's that kind of behavior that we see. One of the things that I do in my program is that we actually have simulations and training where we have actors simulate burnout and that kind of behavior and have my residents address it so that they can actually identify it in their colleagues because they identify quicker than we do as attendings. Because as when we walk in the room, everyone's on their best behavior. And we know that burnout, you can still function, right? You can keep it together for a little while, but you may not keep it together all the time. So we help our trainees identify, and they're better in, in, in um, how would I say, that, um, you know, with our other skills, we diagnose things in other people very easily, but not within ourselves. And so that really helps, but it looks the same as any adult working with adult in a, in a, in a space on a team. Things are just, communication is what usually falls to the wayside. So you're muted, Amy. Sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that makes total sense. And I do, I hear you with when you're a pediatrician, you like kids, yeah. but you're dealing with, you get, like, like you said, every time it's the crazy, the crate. Well, I don't know if we're all crazy, but if our no, kids no, are but sick, it's, it's not crazy. They're not themselves. <laughs> exactly. You when know? your kid's sick, you just want them better. So yeah, yeah, you have to communicate well with grandparents, parents, guardians, whoever it is, and the kids. So it's the spectrum. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I tell my residents to read the room, like you come in and you want to be the most bubbly pediatrician and that's wonderful, but nobody else is in a hospital by choice. Mm -hmm. You're the only one that chooses to come there. Everybody else is basically just counting down the days and hours and you pop in like, good morning, like <laughs> read the room, read the room, you know, see what people are dealing with, meet them where they're at. So right. I'm not, parents aren't crazy, but they're not themselves if their babies aren't well. That's right. Agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And so with this, with this um, veil that we are all experiencing um, as healthcare workers, you know, what do we do to improve the pipeline? Did you see a change in the um, match rate for pediatrics, for example? Um, are there, you know, are less people going into pediatrics? Like, what did you see in the last couple of years? Um, definitely, the um, the workforce is definitely decreasing when it comes to pediatrics. And I think about kind of what are the foundation for those interests, right? We're in medical school, we do our rotations, and that's where you get exposure to the specific field. You know, what are those rotations looking like? And from where I sit, I believe a lot of places are decreasing the amount of, you know, time people spend in pediatrics, and they're putting more attention to a lot of these subspecialties, especially kind of the surgical ones and so on and so forth. And so what you're finding is that learners are kind of, you know, their focus is being shifted. You know, pediatrics may not be sexy anymore. I don't know what, but also the reality of what does the loan burden look like, right? They're saying like, you know, the average in terms of just what graduates are graduating with anywhere from 200 to 215,000, um, you know, um, in debt. And what are the reimbursement rates and what does salary look like for pediatricians? And, you know, our learners are looking at that. You know, if I choose this, you know, I want to help. And, you know, in the background, I thought I was going to be rich, but then I have this that, you know, so I got to find something that, that makes sure it, you know, it picks up for that gap. You also have um, a lot of persons who are first gen, you know? first in med school, first in this, and like myself, then you have kids, right? And you want, them, you want them to go to college. And so you're paying your loan and their loans and so on and so forth. So as we look at the pipeline and kind of, you know, pediatrics, it doesn't look like the, 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 the bucket of, you know, money at the end of the rainbow. And so I think it's really important. So we put a lot of into how we structure our pediatric rotation, ensuring that we're not overrun with learners where we get burnt out and what we transmit is apathy. But what we want is for them to see that passion. 
we love to hear people say, I never thought of pediatrics till we did, I did X, Y, Z rotation. So really important. But then, you know, again, it's the compensation once they go into pediatrics, the subspecialties versus primary care. So the pipeline is already kind of dwindling and that's very difficult. And then you get to all the subspecialties and the ones that pay higher are of course the ones that are more competitive and so on. And if we really get to the reality of how diverse are those groups, not very. So I often hear my residents when they come and they say, oh, I'm gonna do a fellowship, excuse me. Or some of them will say, oh, I'm actually just gonna do general peds. I'm like, what do you mean just general peds? And they'll say, well, you know, it's not fellowship. And I said, what's wrong with that? I said, do you realize gen peds is what feed, feeds all those subspecialties? So if you're not at the gate saying this child is well, this child is sick, how can there be any referrals? So to me, Gen Peds is a specialty too, and that's how I've always seen it. So there's a lot of messaging that's going on in med school that's impacting the pipeline. I think overlaid with access and bias with certain populations and certain groups having access to higher education. And the reality is that when we look at some of what we consider pipeline programs, right? Some of them, the ones that work have to be funded because I remember at that stage when I could do a summer program, if it didn't have a stipend, I couldn't do it because whatever money I was gonna make is what's gonna help buy school clothes and stuff like that. So those are those realities that unless places are thinking about the pipeline that early and that another mouth to feed needs to generate an income as early as possible, despite having an interest in the STEM fields, some of the stuff that's happening with this pipeline won't stop it from continuing to be leaky, which we've all seen that picture with the leaky pipeline water coming out at all sides. So a lot needs to be done with the realities of finances and communities with less resources and so on um, that really need access to resources so they can contribute equally to a system that needs them on so many levels. Yeah, that's really important everything that you said there and i think the other the other thing not only dealing with the medical school and the recruitment piece but part of the leakiness in the pipeline is the attrition rate that happens especially with um black and brown uh residents in particular and so you know bonnie simpson mason gave a gave a presentation about this a couple of years ago and she showed you know while while there hasn't been an increase in the amount of black residents, for example, in like over over 20 years, um, it's about four to five percent in like overall, while other uh, race and ethnicities have increased because the number of residents have increased. The attrition rate in black residents is the highest. And so we're, we're, it's like a double whammy, right? Because now you're, you're recruiting less <laughs> and then the ones that you have, you can't retain mm -hmm. um, because the system, again, the system. Um, and so what can we do to, to, in these institutions, in these programs to improve these working conditions, to prevent this attrition rate, to, to get ahead of it um, and recognize that black residents are not going into residency with the same experience you know, resource support that other residents um, are going into residency with? Mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the mindset. And a part of that mindset is one can be, I don't care what faculty or anybody looks like, I'm here and I'm gonna do it no matter what. And I would say that was part of my experience. Like no matter what anyone looks like, I'm gonna, do me and get what I have to get. But we also know that there's, you know, biases and stuff that determine some of the grades and all of that. And so my thing was, I know that that's gonna play a part, but I'm gonna work my damnedest. So if anything, you have a hard um, case to prove to say I'm not worthy of where I am. And not to say that that's easy, it's not easy. And then you have others that the mindset is that I need to see folks like me to feel welcome, to feel like I have a resource, whether I want to use it or not, I need something tangible and visual to say I belong here. We know that that's going to be a challenge, right? Because we look at the data on Black faculty and retention and so on and so forth. So 
I remember going through medical school and it was like, once I saw um, a black doctor, it was like, oh my God, what's your name? It was like finding a unicorn. And, you know, that was what, when I was in Rochester, that's what Cheryl Kojo or Kujo, or however she says her name was to me. I wasn't interested in adolescent medicine, but <gasps> a black doctor, you know? And so as I look at kind of what can impact that, I know that there are a lot of folks of color that I have recruited in my program. And when I say to them on their exit interview, tell me what made you come to Maimonides? And some of them will upfront say, because I saw you. And I heard that you were there for that long, so it can't be that bad. Mm. But I also have that conversation with them when they're leaving, because nowhere is perfect. Any program is just a smaller microcosm of what society looks like. So they're going to be, um, how would I say, the microaggressions and some of the macroaggressions and all this stuff. But the question is where you stand, do you feel empowered to address it? And a lot of them, at least a few of them have said, because I know you're in leadership, I address it because I know someone will have my back. Mm. So that visual perception yeah. is really important, but you don't want it to do, just be perception. You also want to be able to speak that, right? Because we also have folks of color that are there and they're very protective of a certain dialogue, which is this place is perfect. What you're feeling is in your mind and you just need to, you know, and I'm happy to be at a place where, as I said, one of the reasons I chose Maimonides when it was time to become a faculty member is because I interviewed at all the same hospitals um, as a resident that when I was a faculty member, I also interviewed. And at the other places, nothing changed. It was the same leadership doing the same thing, saying the same thing. I came to Maimonides and it had done complete 360. And I'm like, you know what? If things can change, I can be here. Cause I know that's one of the things I like. I like change. I've been lucky that they have wanted to change me, but <laughs> um, maybe that's cause, you know, I see a place where I roll with the punches and I think nowhere's perfect. But as I think about my learners, I can say to them, if there's something that you think that needs to happen, let's have a discussion and there are people and enough allyship where something can get done. And I think that's the other important piece. So even if learners, learners of color or you know, um, minority in medicine folks, even if they're not at a place where they see someone that looks like them, the question is what does allyship look like? And if it's not there, attrition, impossible. Right. Impossible. Right. So it sounds like the answer, you know, what I'm what I'm gleaning from all the things that you're talking about and in your position, you know, change is slow, number one, and it's difficult and it's not perfect any, everywhere. But one place to put a lot of energy for systems that are looking to make change is if you can get the right people in your institution. You get the right representation. Just just getting the representation is the, is is step one. Correct. You know, and 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 having folks feel like there's a there's opportunities to express themselves and express the things, the deficiencies, without any type of repercussions. Correct. That's, a, that's going to be a way to get conversation on the table, so that systems can start the process of saying, okay, you know, we we're hearing you, we we're hearing these issues. Let's see what we could do to address it. It's not perfect. You know, we're we're gonna move slow. Academia slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I left. <laughs> it's because mm -hmm. it's too slow for me. You know, but but. But the fact is that we're we're actually moving, we're in a forward trajectory as opposed Correct. to standing still. Um, and one of the ways to to improve that working condition is just to have folks that are from the community, really, who are mm -hmm. represented in the institution Correct. and are in places of power where they can affect change um, in a way that's going to benefit not only the system, not only the, 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 the human beings that are working in the system, but also the community that they're serving. Yeah. So, 
you know, because because with the new ACGME requirement about diversifying and, you know, recruiting and so on and so forth, you know, everybody is kind of like grabbing one, right? Because they're, you know, but remember, it's a small pool that we're working with, right? So we need, in essence, to kind of go further back again and starting that recruitment and what that looks like from junior high school, high school and so on and telling these kids their possibilities. There's so much possibilities. One of the things I have my residents do is they go into the community and teach classes. I want them, and I said to them, again, addressing burnout, you stay 100% in the hospital, you forgot why you went into medicine. Leave the hospital and go out in the community, you will remember within five minutes. And That's so right. it's really important that right. they get out and go into those classrooms, and that will impact the workforce. But as folks are kind of looking, and I've had colleagues say, you know, my residency has like no representation and so on. And it's because we're very rural, we're so on and so forth. And they're like, where do I start? And I'm like, start by saying you lack it and you acknowledge it. There are folks of color that are very brave that will say, I will step into that space as long as you know there's a problem. And I can also see where I can start conversations. I don't think anybody should step in the space where it's going to be, now it's your job to fix this, right? And I kind of feel like as I've seen those opportunities for um, equity and inclusion officers and so on and so forth, I have my own personal reason where as much as I love the activities, I don't want that job. I don't want that job. And I, you know, I kind of joke you know, with my circle. And I said, well, if I've been excluded all along, how can I be the head of inclusion? I don't know what that is. <laughs> but um, Zinger. <laughs> um, but I just want a seat at the table with a larger community because we didn't get to this place by ourselves. So what the solution looks like is a group of people that are representative of all people because one person can't figure it out nor one should one person be responsible. So I feel like if those programs that don't have that representation go through a process of identifying why they don't and verbalizing that, then people know what they're getting into. So when that person who says, you know what, I don't see anybody look that looks like me, but there's enough allyship there where I know despite our physical differences, there's a shared interest. I think things will move along slowly but it'll move along. So it sounds like now we've gotten to two. So one is representation across the institution for folks to be in positions of power to affect those changes um, because they've had the lived experience of the community. Mm -hmm. And the second is actually integrating community work in your programs so that mm -hmm. people know what they're doing and who mm -hmm. they're working for and how they're serving. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. so many hospitals and, and physicians and leaders, physician leaders and administrators who are working in these underserved communities who have no clue what the community is really going through. Correct. Um, and really, and I think that's the detriment, right? That's the detriment. We're, we're living in the in intellectual, hypothetical, like mm -hmm. this model should work kind of place without understanding what it takes to implement changes and mm -hmm. implement programs in real time in the community. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like, you know, this is one of my soapboxes is, you know, we have to do a better job of communicating with our social scientists and actually integrating a lot of the work that we do in medicine mm -hmm. with the community and with in partnership with our social scientists, because it's, the, I can't take care of a human being you know, properly without knowing what their, what their living situation is. And to your mm -hmm. point, this whole holistic, it's, it, it, it boggles me because I'm just like, how, do, how do you, how can you take care of somebody's diabetes and their yeah. home and you don't know that? Well, well, you know? well, I think the importance now is kind of this big shift to social determinants of health. And I think it's wonderful that we have formalized the knowledge or formalized what we're calling it, because these are issues that a lot of communities have been dealing with, right? And a lot of people in those communities have been labeled um, to some extent, you know, um, when someone will not cooperate with it, um, you know, difficult patient or that they're not doing what they have to do. But now with social determinants of health, and I have colleagues who are champions for this and really, you know, screening for this, asking about food insecurity, um, housing insecurity, asking about employment, 
asking about all these things while they're coming into the primary care space and referring them and linking them back to community-based organizations, right? But the one of the caveats that I have is that it's not just screening, it's also laying that foundation so that our doctors and physicians that train in this country, because they're physicians who train outside of this country that come to care for folks in this country, where their thought is, this group of people must just be lazy. They're not acknowledging mm -hmm. that there's an entire historical foundation where mm -hmm. these communities have been held back with, you know, different policies, redlining and so on that yeah. have barred them from wealth, um, you know, um, generational wealth and such, despite their huge contributions to this country. So to me, as you're doing social determinants of health work, stepping back and looking at the origins as to why these populations are you know lacking resources the way they were built there's going to be no parks no, no greenery no this some of them are food deserts you know you're not going to have healthy foods and so on so, so having them understand this which we have rotations where our residents do community mapping so when you're talking to a family about obesity and there's a high crime rate and so on don't tell them to go out for walks in the evening they might not live right. you right. know so getting that understanding. So I think um, I'm really appreciative of social determinants of health, but it has to be delivered in the right context so that physicians who are doing this screening are coming to this space with a lack of judgment about the mm -hmm. families who they have to give resources to. Because my family, an immigrant to this country, looks like a lot of my patients. And regardless of what we don't have, we're proud. Mm -hmm. And so we don't beg for anything, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be very delicate in how you deliver these resources and be respectful. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have to shout out, and I'm going to let Amy ask her next question, but what you're talking about is not the social determinants of health. What you're talking about are the social determinants of equity. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that Dr. Kamara uh, Phyllis-Jones talks a lot about. Um, for anybody listening who wants to understand this more, she has this allegory called the cliff analogy yes. uh, that you can find on YouTube that really does an amazing job of explaining the social determinants of equity. And it's exactly what you're talking about here. It's about, it's the context of the social determinants of health. It's not just the fact that you're in a food desert, but why? <laughs> why mm -hmm. are you in a food desert? Mm -hmm. Why is it that this particular population is where they are? And having a real deep understanding of that can help you deliver the care a lot more efficiently. So I'm, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, there's just so many pieces of the puzzle that we need to work on and improve. Um, it's I'm, again, very impressive, all of the things that you, you are thinking about and doing. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, another question I had, or we had is how can patients and providers improve trust? Mm -hmm. I know that's a big one. <laughs> Well, I think um, some of the, the 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 concepts I talk about talked about, which is diversifying the workforce. Um, I think a lot of trust will be built when patients start seeing more people, you know, that look like them, and that can, to some extent, speak their language and understand the nuances of body language as well as just that, you know, the language being spoken. We have the benefit of interpreters and we use that quite a bit. And that's a huge part of our training with our residents, the use of interpreters. And I think as folks are coming into the, um, the, the um, healthcare space and they're seeing that all of this work is being done to meet them where they are, I think that's important. But there's also kind of bi-directional bias, right? Because early in my training, I've had people who didn't want me as a physician because they made some assumptions about me and what that looks like. And I'm very happy to be at an institution where that's a policy, where um, you know discrimination by the patient towards the provider is not tolerated either. So I think there's going to have to be behaviors as well as policies. And we, fun we focus on patient safety and there's a lot being done and a lot more can be done because God knows healthcare has its mishaps and so on and so forth. But again, just starting to build trust is that bi-directional bias and trying to impact that. And a part of that is the humility required for us to all the various patients that we're treating 
but for them, as we diversify the workforce, for them to accept that what a good physician looks like comes in many shapes, forms, um, sexual identity, race, ethnicities, all of that. And don't assume, don't assume. I'm from Jamaica, I'm a black woman, I look like that, but I can't tell you how many times I've been in healthcare spaces where they're just yelling at the Spanish speaking patient and I am fluent in Spanish, so I can step in. So that's the other component that I love about my residents. They come with various languages and skills. We don't use them as interpreters, but sometimes reading the room and kind of being able to de-escalate some situations, that is really important. And so no assumptions being made, but I, I, the assumptions being made, um, I think trust can be built if we find ways to address that bi-directional bias that happens. I'm so glad you say that because I, th I think you're correct. Most people are just like, oh, patient safety and patients come first and whatnot. But yeah, it has to be, you know, my husband's a physician. He comes home very burnt, pediatrician, <laughs> and comes home sometimes very burned out. And, you know, he'll sometimes say, you know, some something about clinic and maybe there was like a tough interaction. I'm like, well, that's not okay. They can't be mean to you. <laughs> you know, just because you're taking care of their child, that's not okay. So it has to be both ways. I completely agree. Yeah. Cause you, you know, we all see, we need to see all of us as um, humans yeah. interacting to take care of each other. And you can't um, just see physicians as heroes that you bang the pots at eight o'clock every night and that's going to recharge them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. So, yeah. Well, that's I, right. I, I remember being on call and I had a, uh, um, I was in residency and we used to take home calls for, you know, and I had a newborn and uh, I was answering a, a page at like, it was two in the morning. Of course, my newborn woke up and started crying and the patient on the phone was like, oh my God, you're home. You have a baby. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's what happens at two in the morning. We're people too. So that exactly. rash that's been there for two weeks. Can we talk about that in the morning, please? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because there's this perception that, yeah, you know, we're going to be that emotional container that takes a lot of that, but we're humans too, you know? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Walker Descartes, we could talk to you all day. <laughs> this has been amazing, but we want to uh, respect your time. Thank you so much, so, so much for joining us. What a rich discussion. Uh, we really appreciate it. Well, yeah, thank, thank you for you. the invitation, Tony and Amy. It was my absolute pleasure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much.